But take your Bible this morning, if you will, please, and turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. We'll be reading one verse this morning. Acts 18 and verse 30. And notice there, Acts 18 and verse 30, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. Father, this morning as we would look at a portion of Thy word, though written 3,000 years ago, Lord, we know it, it still pertains to us to this day and the principles therein. Help us now, Father, at this time that your name might be glorified, your word might be magnified, and the Savior lifted up. May your people be strengthened and encouraged this morning. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 18, in my opinion, is one of the mountain peak psalms. It was penned by David in his sunset years. And here in the text before us today, David reflects back on Number one, God's perfect way. Number two, God's proven word. And number three, God's protective care. And that's all true to this day. And so let's look at these three thoughts here this morning. Number one, God's perfect way. His way is perfect. As for God, His way is perfect. Uh, and I would submit to you today that God's way of salvation is perfect. Amen. It is simple and it is complete. It's faith in the finished work of Christ. And uh, that, that's pretty simple, folks. Trusting Him and Him alone. There's nothing complicated about God's perfect plan of salvation. It's simply turning to and trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, across the land, now we, we live out in, in Minnesota. It's uh, the land of Lutherans and loons and lunatics. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there are several popular Errors, and I'm, I'm sure it's, it's here in this community as well, two popular errors which proliferate pertaining to salvation. Number one is that salvation is somehow or other initiated by baptism. And the pastor touched on this a bit in the Sunday school hour. Uh, some teach that salvation is initiated by baptism, or that baptism somehow washes away sin, or that in baptism some, uh, one somehow becomes a Christian, or that one receives Christ by being baptized. And there's all these erroneous thoughts, but it goes back to you need to get baptized. When we were building our church building uh, in 1992, and the men of the church largely did the work, uh, they'd get off work at, at about four o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, go to work until dark. And the neighbor across the street came over and said, boy, you Baptists are a bunch of beavers. And, uh, and so I started to witness to him. His name was Bill Peterson. And I said, Bill, let me ask you something. If you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? He said, oh, my pastor told me I took care of that when I got baptized. And he told me he went to the big Methodist church in town, which meant when he got sprinkled as an infant. Folks, I hate to say it, but that's the error of the devil. Baptism does not wash away sin. Look, I, I realize you're in a, a rented facility, and I understand that. We were in rented facilities when we started the church years ago. Uh, but uh, all the baptistry water in the world never washed away one sin. And by the way, I'm Baptist born and Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. But baptism has nothing to do with getting saved. It's trusting Jesus Christ. Now, a second error that goes hand in hand, usually with this thought, is that uh, getting saved is by being a good guy, a good person, a good gal. In Minnesota, uh, they talk about being Minnesota nice, be nice to each other, nice people. In fact, at, at the big airport in Minneapolis, there's a mall right in the middle of the airport, and one of the stores is called Minnesota Nice. Well, I have no problem with a person being nice. And, uh, but being nice has nothing to do with God's salvation. Being a good person has nothing to do with getting saved. And if all uh, being a good person and doing good stuff is all that's necessary, Jesus would not have to die on the cross. The fact is, for by grace are you saved through faith. 
and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of good works, lest any man should boast. And folks who are relying upon the fact that they had some water sprinkled upon them once upon a time, and they've been a good person, relatively speaking, throughout the course of their life, folks, when, when, when they cross from this life into the next, they're in for a rude, a rude awakening. Because that is not what gets the job done. It's by turning to and trusting in Jesus Christ. God's perfect way of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God, uh, but as many as received him, I should say, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's turning to and trusting in Jesus Christ. It's God's perfect way of salvation. But not only is God's way of salvation perfect, but folks, I would submit to you this morning that God's way of living is perfect. In Titus chapter 2, we read, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation teaches us that denying ungodly, uh, ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Well, there's a recipe for the Christian life right there. To deny uh, ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly. Did, did you get that word? Soberly. That kind of cuts out social drinking, which is a scourge across churches to this day. That we should live soberly and righteously. We could pe preach a whole message this morning on righteousness in the practical outworking and the day to day living and godly in our day-to-day -day lives. God's way of living is perfect. And David looked back over his 70 years of life and said, as for God, his way is perfect. It was perfect then, folks. It's perfect now. It hasn't changed. But I would submit a, a third area where God's way is perfect, and that is God's will for our lives. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we read, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove, that means test, find out, figure out, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God has a perfect will for your life. And uh, I, having been in the ministry for many years, over 50 in fact, I, I, I found that over the years Christian young people often are afraid of God's will. Uh, why, if I submit to God's will, he's going to send me as a missionary to outer Mongolia or lower Slobovia, wherever that's at. Well, maybe, but probably not. But folks, whatever God's will for your life is, it's good and it's acceptable and it's perfect. First medicine. I'm a preacher's kid. In fact, my grandfather was a preacher, so I don't know if that makes me a grand preacher's kid or whatever. But I grew up in the parsonage, and that, that's back in the days when churches had parsonages. Uh, and I, I went to a large secular high school, public high school, 3,000 students there in central Illinois where I, my growing up years were. And um, my sophomore year in high school, we had to take a vocations class, real exciting class, to try and figure out what profession or career or, or uh, line of work that we might be suited for when we, we got out into the real world. And so we took this proficiency test, and folks, for me, the bottom of the list, I mean, below zero was going in the ministry. That's the last thing that I wanted to do, would be in the ministry. You say, wow, after 50 years later, you must be pretty miserable. No. God's will is perfect and it's acceptable. You don't have to be afraid of God's will. It's the best thing that'll ever happen to you. And you'll never be happier than when you're in the center of God's will. And so God's way is perfect, whether for salvation, whether for our daily living, whether it's his will for our life, whatever it might be, it's perfect. But I'd suggest a second thing here this morning, and that is in the text here, God's proven word. Notice, 
Uh, the word of the Lord is tried. The idea is of how it's been tested. In a metallurgical term, it's been assayed. And it's been found perfect. And the Bible just stands. It stood the test of time. It's been attacked endlessly. But the Bible just stands. The Romans burned it. The popes banned it. William Tyndale, in fact, the book back there on the table, The Faithful Word, has, a, has an artist's depiction of William Tyndale being burned at the stake for the crime of translating and, and printing the Bible in English language. The communists outlawed it. Christians in the old Soviet Union used to mimeograph copies of pages of the Bible. Now, folks, I realize we live in the 21st century. But how many here remember mimeograph machines in churches? Yeah, some of you older folks do. I mean, you go back 50 years ago, maybe even, even shorter than that, uh, every church had a mimeograph machine. They didn't have photocopiers back then, digital stuff, that wasn't invented yet. But uh, you'd sit down, the secretary would sit down, on, and in and, and our church, she did, she did it on Thursday morning, took all morning to do this. She would type on a typewriter, kids say, what's a typewriter? Type on a typewriter, and you put a, a stencil into the typewriter and start typing out what needed to be typed, and uh, then you'd made a typo. Oh my, woe be to you. Because then you had to uh, turn the, the platinum back up and go and, and put some uh, correction fluid on there on, on the stencil, and then go <laughs> blow on it and hope you dried and then put it back down where it's supposed to be, hit the key, and it splotched and work, looked worse than when, than, than when you started. And then when you had the stencil all typed, you'd put it on a, uh, the, the, the machine, and the machine had paste ink. It was like, literally like axle grease. And it was a crude type of printing. And then you'd turn the crank, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. And if your church was really high-tech, it was electric, which went ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Well, men in the Soviet Union would go into an attic or a basement, some secluded place, and they would sit there uh, and type a, a page out of the Bible onto a mimeograph stencil so that people could have a page out of the Word of God. And, of course, they usually were caught by the KGB and sent to Siberia to some gulag for the crime of reproducing the Word of God. Be thankful you have a Bible and nobody persecutes you for that. God's word has been tried. The liberals have questioned and doubted it, and they do to this day. I'm old enough to remember when the Supreme Court kicked the Bible out of the public schools. Charles Darwin denied it. Lenin has laughed at it. They're all gone, but the Bible still stands. Amen. Right. Voltaire, the French philosopher, said the day would come when the only place you'll find a Bible is in a museum. Well, guess what? Today, Voltaire's house houses the French Bible Society, and they print Bibles out of it. God's Word stands. The Bible has been assayed and found true. It's been tested. Did you know that every archaeological find in the Middle East has verified biblical history? Every archaeological find in the land of Israel and in that region has verified biblical history. It's not undercut it. The Dead Sea Scrolls have verified the veracity of the Old Testament text. And by the way, there are more copies of the Bible that have been printed than any other book in history. I'll take a step farther. There are more copies of the King James Bible that have been printed than any other book in history. And that's a fact. In fact, there's more copies of the King James Bible been printed than all the rest put together of the other versions and translations. That's another subject. I'll get into that a little bit in our class this week. But in Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6, we read, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now, the ancients would take uh, the, the ore, in this case silver ore, and put it into a crucible, 
and it would be heated with a bellows to intense heat so that the ore melted into a liquid state and the refiner would take a tool and, 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 and pull off the, the, they called it dross, it was the impurities, draw it off and, and cast it aside, allowing the, the crucible of silver to uh, uh, cool down and return to a solid state. And then uh, it would be heated again into a liquid state and more impurities would float to the surface. And the refiner would take a tool and draw off the slag, the, the, the dross. And they'd go through that process seven times before the, pure, the, the silver was considered completely pure. You read in the Old Testament in the Bible about fine silver or fine gold. That's talking about the highly refined gold and silver. And the Bible says the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. God's word has stood the test of time. And I might add, it changes lives to this day. Dramatically. If you could come to North Star Baptist Church in Duluth this morning, or next week or whatever, you'd be met at the door by a black gentleman. His name is Tyrone Walker. And let me tell you a little bit about Tyrone Walker. He is a convicted felon. He's an ex-con. He was a number two uh, uh, man in the street gangs in the Twin Cities. He was a tough dude. But one day Tyrone got saved. Amen. And I might add, his wife was in about the same boat. She was an American Indian and she was, uh, walked the streets of Chicago and uh, wandered into a, a, a homeless shelter in Chicago, fell on her knees and cried out to God to save her. And God graciously, miraculously saved Samantha. She came back to Minnesota. Her husband, or, or, or Tyrone, uh, I don't think they were married yet. I, I forget all the little details here. But anyway, uh, he had telephone privileges in, in the prison. And she called him up and led him to Christ uh, over the telephone. Amen. And then they'd do Bible studies over the telephone each day. Folks, today, they are pillars at North Star Baptist Church. She sings in the choir. Their children sing special music. Uh, he is a preacher. He preaches all over the Midwest. He was in Memphis preaching two weeks ago. Uh, he'll be preaching at, at North Star in two weeks, uh, preaching in Minneapolis, preaching in Milwaukee. Uh, he's a powerful preacher, and usually when he preaches, people get saved. And God's, life, uh, God's word changes lives from the criminal underworld to being a preacher of the gospel. During the George Floyd riots in Minneapolis uh, several years ago, Tyrone and Samantha, his wife, went down to Lake Street in Minneapolis where the riots were taking place. And there, out on the street while they were rioting, he was leading people to Christ. Long story, he, uh, and again, it's a long story, but he wound up becoming appointed to the, the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. We are a port city on the Great Lakes. And uh, there was big doings down there, some, some uh, uh, last year where they opened a new facility and the governor was there and the United States senators were there and the mayor was there and all the big shots were there. Tyrone went up and witnessed every one of them to their face. How they needed to get saved. And I would submit to you that God's word changes lives. I remember, this. we're going back some years now, my, my growing up years were in central Illinois in a place called Pekin, Illinois, where my father's church there, Faith Baptist Church. Um, and it's, it, it goes into that book back, that blue book back there on soul winning. Um, and there was a guy in, in that town, in that central Illinois, more or less small town Illinois. And uh, there was a, a guy in that town, let me put it that way to start with. Uh, and, and, and this is the truth, folks. His name was Oscar Meyer. And one of his nicknames was the hot dog. And he was a hot dog. Uh, Oscar played in a rock band. Oscar had a ponytail down his back. And Oscar was doing drugs on the side and selling drugs on the side. And the authorities got wind of this Oscar Meyer guy selling drugs. Now, this was almost 50 years ago. And I mean, I mean drugs are pretty commonplace in every town in America today. But it wasn't then. And the authorities said, we're going to make an example of this Oscar Meyer guy. And so they called up the, the local TV newsrooms, called up the local fire department, 
And at the appointed hour, they all went to Oscar Meyer's apartment. And with the TV cameras running, the firemen literally chopped down his door. And the authorities went in and arrested him and threw him in jail. Well, in, on a Sunday afternoons, a preacher came to the Caswell County Jail there in, in central Illinois, and Oscar Meyer got saved. Amen. And he got out of jail, and his brother-in-law, uh, brother uh, Gary Bond, had just gotten saved. And he said, hey, Oscar, we're going to Faith Baptist Church here in Pekin. Why don't you come with me? And so Oscar and his wife came to Faith Baptist Church, and, and, and Marty, his wife, got saved, and they began to grow in the Lord. And it wasn't that long before he was being, he was one of our bus workers running about picking up boys and girls for Sunday school at, North, at Faith Baptist Church. And he served the Lord ever since. I see him every now and then when we go back to central Illinois. God's word changes lives. But it remains the record of God's truth to this day. Hitler's Mein Kampf has come and gone. Marx's Das Kapital has come and gone. Mao's Little Red Book, The Sayings of Chairman Mao. How many have ever heard of The Sayings of Chairman Mao? Oh, a couple of you, okay. The, the, the Chinese communists back in the, the, the 60s or 70s when it was printed, I forget the exact date, trumpeted that it was the most widely published book in the world. Well, that's not true because the King James Bible is. But today, you talk about uh, Mao's little red book, hardly anybody's ever heard of it. But the Word of God stands. And it's read all over the world every day. Psalm 19 and verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. It was perfect when first inspired. It remains perfect to this day. And there's a lot of theological implications what I just said. But Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is, that's present tense, perfect. It was perfect then, it's perfect to this day. It's absolute truth. It's the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. And Jesus said, Thy Word is truth. Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. How are we sanctified? Through God's Word. That's another message in itself. But we need to read it, meditate upon it, memorize it, obey it. It ought to be part of your daily life, your daily schedule. Uh, Brother Dammer knows kind of the funny story where I used to talk about getting up at 547 every morning to get into the Word. Well, I've backslid a little bit. I got up earlier than that today. <laughs> but folks, whatever, you need to have a time when you get into the Word every single day and spend time with the Savior each day. And so this morning, number one, we've talked about God's perfect way. Number two, God's proven Word. But number three here this morning, God's protective care. Notice here in the text. Uh, he is a buckler to all those that trust in him. You say, what in the world is a buckler? Well, it was a type of shield. We often think of shields, you know, that, that, that kind, of, kind of go like this. And, and, and the heavy infantry would use those big shields. But the, the light infantry would have a shield uh, strapped uh, or buckled onto their, their, their forearm. And wherever their forearm went, there was a shield. And the, the soldier saw an arrow incoming up went the shield. Uh, the soldier saw uh, his enemy coming down with a blow up went with a shield. A buckler. But it's a shield. God said to Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. We're told in Ephesians 6.16 to take the shield of faith. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. That's faith. And we need to trust him first for salvation. But then along the pathway of the Christian life, we need to learn to live by faith. Trust him for every need. Trust him for every problem. I've oft said over the years, it's easier to get saved by faith than it is to live by faith. I mean, uh, there's, it turns out there's more month than there's money. And what do we do? We get all unglued and, and, and shook up about it. Well, folks, if we follow the Word of God, He's promised to, to, to meet our needs. My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Trust Him for our needs. Trust Him for guidance. Trust Him for strength. Trust Him for deliverance in trouble. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. 
I'm mindful of the promise there in Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, under his protective care. That's another message in itself. Psalm 84 and verse 12, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Psalm 91 and verse 11, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. When I get to heaven, folks, I want to shake hands with my guardian angel because I think I've given a good run for the money over the years. Trust him for protection. Trust him for deliverance. I mentioned to the pastor that I, uh, I had cancer not two, three years ago. And I believe the Lord has healed me of it. Uh, that's stage four cancer. And uh, my, uh, my wife saw it on the, the, the PET scan uh, images. And my body was full of cancer. And the Lord took it away. Next time I went back to the doctor, it was gone. That's another story. I don't have time to get into that here today. But trust him for his protective care, for his blessing, for his help. And so David looked back over 70 years. And his life was long and rich with battles and victories, with adventures and conquests. But he came to three simple conclusions. God's way is perfect, God's word is proven, and God takes care of his people. And folks, those three truths are true to this day. Amen. They're true to this day. Now, I'm a guest preacher here today. I, uh, I don't know who's a visitor here today. I don't know anything about you. The pastor has not clued me in on that about anybody. People sometimes think the pastor clues in a special speaker so he can preach at them. Well, I'll show you that's not happening, and that rarely, if ever, happens. But are you sure today, my friend, that you're on your way to heaven? I'm not asking if you hope you'd like to go to heaven or you think you might go to heaven. I'm asking you, do you know? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt? You can know so today.